morning again. Good morning. All right. Well, we have a lot in store for you all today, um, and I hope that you all are energized and excited, and it sounds like you are. There's a lot to be energized about when we're talking about health equity and the fight to reduce health disparities. On behalf of ALC co-chair, Dr. Robin Kelly, chair of the Congressional, Cau Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, I want to welcome you to the 2017 Health Brain Trust Town Hall and Innovation Expo. Now, we've done things a little bit different than prior uh, Health Brain Trust. Usually, we just have a series of panels, which is good and a good way to have conversations about the important issues that we're facing. But this year, we wanted to be a little bit more engaging and have an interactive demo and Health Innovation Expo following our town hall. And the reason is, uh, in addition to being able to have a good conversation about health equity, it's good to see what things are coming around the bend, what ideas are coming uh, to fruition, and what new technologies are coming to market in the health space to help, help reduce health disparities. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to introduce Congresswoman Robin Kelly, my boss, who for the past two Congresses has been fighting fiercely to reduce health disparities in America and has the intent goal, intense goal excuse me, of reducing health disparities in a generation. So without further ado, Congresswoman Kelly. Thank you so much and another good morning to you and thank you so much for being here. Welcome to day three of the 47th Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference and more specifically to the Health Brain Trust. The CBC ALC is the premier conference in the country that highlights policies and legislation most salient to the African American community. The Health Brain Trust plays an integral part toward championing these policies, which you get at the root of the disparities within African American communities and promote the health equity of our nation. This ALC, the Brain Trust, draws focus to the direction of care, systems, deliverables of health. First, you will hear from an illustrious panel of providers and industry leaders who will speak to us about medical innovation, strategies towards prevention of and the war against obesity, the significance of clinical trials, our mental health, the opioid crisis, shifts in approaches to costly chronic conditions, and the role of medical leaders of, across generations in ushering a new era of health and health care. Precision, prevention, innovation, equity. This is the future of our health. To lead us in a dynamic discussion is our panel moderator, Dr. Ray Bignall. Dr. Bignall is a clinical fellow in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at Cincinnati's Children's Hospital Medical Center. His research interests include social determinants of health, population health, and health disparities in pediatric kidney disease and transplantation. The National Minority Equality Forum recognized him as a 40 under 40 leader in minority health. We are fortunate and proud that Dr. Bignall joins us today. Following our panel, I invite you to help me celebrate leaders in health care and in health policy through our annual awards ceremony. Then I encourage you to stick around and visit with some of the nation's most innovative health care providers, industry leaders, academicians, and health organizations as they showcase cutting edge treatments, products, and research during our Future of Health 2020 Expo. Friends, we must remain vigilant to that which threatens progress toward health equity. We must rage against ideas and proposed policies. I'm going to say that again. We must rage against ideas and proposed policies, which if enacted, will literally cut short the lives of families and individuals who depend on access to affordable, comprehensive, and culturally competent care, irrespective of previous conditions or self-identity. The latest idea and policy presented to undermine the ACA is the Cassidy-Graham bill in the Senate. The Cassidy-Graham plan is just another partisan ACA repeal bill that would have the same devastating effects as the previous repeals bill. This is a desperate last ditch effort and is the worst bill yet. And I always tell people the ACA was a start. It, it's not the end. And we know there's things that need to be improved, but we don't want to just throw the baby out with the bathwater. We know there are good things that have been done, but we also know there's still millions of people who don't have health care. This plan would cut Medicare coverage, which has been critical to millions of Americans, and would cap funding for states, meaning fewer people and families' coverage, higher costs for care, and less benefits. It would eliminate the guaranteed protection of the ACA's marketplace subsidies, which currently help almost 9 million people afford coverage. 
those of us fighting the health equity fight, who care about eliminating health disparities, and more so about generating innovative strategies to promote health equity, know that we can't take our health today and the future of our health tomorrow for granted. The future of our health matters and we need to be bold in challenging the public health community and our public servants to do more to strengthen our health, not strip it away with bad proposals like Cassidy Graham and what we're seeing from this administration and this Congress. Again, we need your voices. You're the ones that stopped the ACA from being repealed the first time. We need, we need your voices, we need your phone calls, we need your facts, we need your texts. You don't have to send them to me, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> now more than ever, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for your service, for your advocacy, your engagement, your presence, whether you're a nurse, a physician, a dentist, an allied health professional, student, provider and trainer, academician, health advocate or well-informed citizen, I thank you and urge you to continue raising your voices. Together we will make the difference that matters for our health. Thank you again so much for being here. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Thicken on to the stage. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, I want to get in on this good good morning greeting that everyone's been getting. Um, it is beyond an honor to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Dr. Ray Bignall, as was said earlier. I'm a clinical fellow in pediatric nephrology at Cincinnati Children's. I'm proud to be um, in the Buckeye State. Uh, and I'll just let you know, earlier this week, I uh, had a little extra time, so I did what all of us should do. I went down to the Hart Senate Office building and I talked to Senator Sherrod Brown. He's on board with us. Uh, I went down to uh, the Russell building and I spoke to the uh, staff for Senator Rob Portman and he needs a little bit of help, some encouragement. Um, and I would encourage all of you to take some time to speak to your senators and their staff. Uh, if you need help, if you've never made a call to your staff members, just find me afterwards after this panel. I will sit down with you, we will call them together, I will walk you through what you need to say. It is not difficult. Uh, these folks are people just like you and me and every now and then they need a little encouragement, amen? Well, we're going to help them out. Um, I wanted to uh, also just say a huge thank you to the Brain Trust for the invitation to come. It's uh, a tremendous honor and highlight of my young career thus far. A special thank you to uh, Congresswoman Dr. Robin Kelly for hosting this panel, for the work that she has done as chair of the Brain Trust. You know, uh, we've made some terrific advancements in uh, health care, including some uh, narrowing of some health disparities over the last several years. Uh, but we've got a long, long way to go in order to achieve the tripartite aim of the Health Brain Trust to strengthen our communities, to improve access to care, and to eliminate disparities in a generation. What an ambitious uh, goal, but one that we should all be striving towards. So it's my desire today to maximize time for your interaction with our panel. Uh, so in order to do that, without further ado, I'll provide some ground rules for our panelists. We are encouraging some informative uh, but concise responses. And for our audience, uh, you guys need to be active in uh, preparing questions for our panel. Uh, participate uh, with uh, these folks who've come uh, from far and wide to uh, help inform us about the future of our health. Um, I would invite my panel to join me on the stage at this time. Just come on up the stairs and we'll get started. I'll begin with the introductions as the panelists are making their way up. Uh, the first member of our panel is Dr. Ian Smith. He's the creator and founder of the National Health Initiative entitled the 50 Million Pound Challenge. He served as a member of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition under President Barack Obama, a graduate of Harvard College, the Teachers College of Columbia University, and the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He is a noted author, including of his most recent book. Go ahead and uh, show the people that book there. Blast the sugar out. I'm going to help promote my brother's work. It's a New York Times bestseller. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ian Smith. Continuing on, my friend Dr. Lauren Robinson is an internist and pediatrician by training, 
uh, but she serves as the Deputy Secretary for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention uh, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Department of Health. She's a graduate of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, where she also served as a fellow in the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics and the Penn Institute for Urban Research. Um, Dr. Robinson's research and work primarily focus on, focuses on the social determinants uh, that impact health outcomes for the citizens of her commonwealth, and the, uh, she's also a National Minority Equality Forum uh, 40 under 40 leader in minority health. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Lauren Robbins. <laughs> Dr. Christy Gamble is next. She is the Director of Health Policy and Legislative uh, Advocates, excuse me, uh, uh, of Health Policy and Legislative Affairs, beg your pardon, at the Black Women's Health Imperative where she's an advocate for policies that reduce racial health disparities and improve overall health of marginalized communities. Her recent activities include advocating for increased adoption and coverage of 3D mammography for breast cancer screenings in state legislatures across the country. She's a licensed law practitioner in two states, an epidemiologist, uh, she's a noted sports enthusiast, uh, she's even been named a Google Next Gen Policy Leader and a National Minority Equality Forum 40 Under 40 Leader in Minority Health, uh, Dr. Christy Gamble. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Sneed. Dr. Sneed is professor, founding dean of the University of, of South Florida's College of Pharmacy and senior associate vice president of USF Health in Tampa, Florida. At USF, Dr. Sneed has been integral in transforming the way pharmacy students uh, learn and apply interdisciplinary ideas to changing and improving health care in the community. His research includes examining disparities in health and the advanced pharmacologic treatment of patients with cardiometabolic disorders. His innovative ideas have been carried into the classroom where he demonstrates new ways to educate and encourage the pharmacists of tomorrow. Please welcome Dr. Sneed to our panel. We're also pleased to be joined today by Dr. David Mahoney. Dr. Mahoney is the Chief Medical Officer of Lifeline Vascular Access. It's a subsidiary of DeVita Kidney Care Incorporated, uh, a practicing nephrologist for over 20 years. Dr. Mahoney serves as a liaison among interventionalists, physician practices, operating teams, and patients. He is interested in further expanding Lifeline's vascular care services beyond dialysis alone uh, as the company continues to embrace care coordination in an evolving health care environment. Let's please welcome Dr. Mahoney. And it is also my pleasure to welcome to our panel Dr. Doris Brown. Dr. Brown serves as the 118th president of the National Medical Association, uh, the NMA, as you may know, which is the collective voice of African American physicians and a leading force for parity and justice in medicine and the elimination of disparities in health. She is also the president uh, and CEO of Brown and Associates Incorporated, a health consulting company focusing on the health needs of national and international populations. Among numerous accomplishments, Dr. Brown served as a Woodrow Wilson Public Policy Scholar, former breast cancer portfolio manager at the National Cancer Institute, and a retired colonel of the United States Army Medical Corps. Let's please welcome to the stage Dr. So at this time, I will invite our panelists to uh, share with us their two-minute prepared remarks, and I'll begin with Dr. Ian Smith. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't really have prepared remarks because I'm more interested in hearing what you guys have to say and what you want to ask, but I do want to say two quick things. One is um, thanks to uh, Congresswoman Kelly for inviting me, um, um, my fellow Chicagoan, and um, uh, what she said was so important as she was standing here talking, I was thinking about um, the issues we as a country have faced, particularly as it comes to equity um, and the history of it. And health is the 
new frontier of equity. And I don't think it gets the kind of, um, the kind of attention uh, that it deserves. I mean, you look at the civil rights movement, you look at the right to vote and all these different historic uh, things, uh, education. Well, health is the new one. And I really hope that young and old really rally around the importance because it is the health disparity that is really separating us, our children, and particularly separating where our futures are. And so we need to, I've been, I usually don't do these kind of panels. I feel like these panels often, you know, preach to the choir. Um, but I feel like this is so important that this is a real fight. And when she said rage, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time um, and a different platform on TV and media, but, and I told someone earlier, I'm tired. Uh, but I'm not giving up, but I'm tired. And I want other people uh, to pick up the fight um, and to really make this a personal issue, even if, the, even if it doesn't affect your family particularly, it's important for all families, important for all Americans. The second thing I want to talk about real fast is how sugar, how bad sugar is. I've decided that each year I'm going to choose something that is causing problems for us. And this year I decided to fight sugar uh, because it's so prevalent uh, and most people don't realize it. And so I brought today a little demonstration so you guys can see about how bad the problem is, okay? So, this is how much sugar the average American consumes in the course of the day, right here. This much sugar. This is how much we consume in the course of a week. Three pounds of sugar, the average American. So some are consuming more than this. And then this is how much we consume over the course of a month in sugar. So over the course of the year, the average American consumes 156 pounds of sugar. 60% of these sugars are added sugars by manufacturers, okay? And one of the issues that we're facing in our community when we talk about obesity and disparities is that sugar is a major player in the rates of obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, and risk factors for heart disease. Now, it's become in vogue to talk about sales tax on sugar, the sugar tax or sweet tax. And I won't get into that now. If I'm asked later, I will. But one of my issues is that when you look at this idea of a, a penalty tax on sugar, you have to look at the communities that are being disproportionately affected. If you go to the south side of Chicago where I live, okay, and I got this idea of watching kids walk, high school and, and lower school kids walking out of the gas station bodega store and what they were eating and drinking, okay? Flaming Hots and Snapple iced teas, okay? Full of sugar. But now we're saying that we're going to tax sugar because sugar is bad for us. We're going to tax it but look how you're disproportionately affecting those who are consuming the sugar. I would like to further in the conversation get into why I think that the sugar tax is not a bad idea, but it's bad the way they put it, they've set it up, okay? And I wanna talk about why we need to tax, but not at the consumer level, and why it disproportionately affects lower income and particularly um, minority uh, communities. So this is my framework this year in my book, Blast the Sugar Out, I'm trying to get people to realize by just reducing the amount of sugar you consume, not eliminating it, by the way. Sugar actually is very healthy for you in certain, in certain ways. But by reducing it, we can make a big impact on our children and all of us. Thank you. Well, good morning. And on you all. And also, thank you to Congressman Kelly to, for inviting us and having such an adverse panel. So I was impressed by everyone I'm sitting up here with and can't wait to hear kind of how we bring it all together. Um, one of the things that I found um, from going to a lot of conferences and being on a lot of panels is um, it's really helpful to have something to take away. It's really helpful to have something that I can think about once I leave that, that room and say, what can I do and what can I do with the information I learned? So that's one of the things I would like to charge the audience with today and the panel as well. So, we are technically the experts, but I would, I would put forth that I think this audience has all kinds of expertise and we want to hear from you. But we need to each in this room think about how do I, in my space, make a change. Um, for me, that's the reason that I uh, came a little bit out of clinical practice and started working in the policy sector. So uh, when I was doing my residency training in North Carolina, I was so excited to leave med school and fix everything with my prescription pad and my pen. Uh, then they were like, no, we're doing the electronic prescriptions now. Uh, but then I realized there's so much of what my patients came to talk to me about or complain about or say was going wrong or going on in their lives that I couldn't fix with my prescription pad. Um, and then when it came to it and we thought about what 
system, systemically was going on, uh, the people who were making the policies also didn't look like the people I was seeing in my clinic. Um, and so for me, the, the call was twofold. One, I wanted to serve my community, but I also think it's really important to have your, fa your face reflected in, in all levels. So whether it's the classroom, the boardroom, um, you need to see your face reflected. And so uh, after training at a, or going to a historically black college for undergrad, um, it never ceases to amaze me kind of as I go into these different rooms, uh, how few people look like me. Um, and that should not be the exception because that's not what the country looks like. And that's not the direction uh, the country is going in, although folks may have you think otherwise. Um, so we all need to be thinking about when we're in these rooms, uh, how do we talk to folks who don't look like us and let them understand our story without isolating uh, folks and not being able to let them hear us? How do we tell our story and bring people who don't necessarily look like us or go through our struggles, how do we help them understand things like that? As a physician, we talk a lot about data. Uh, we have a lot of big words that describe some of the, the, the things that we see in our clinics or in our hospitals or in our ORs, but we've got to speak to folks where they are and hear their stories from where they are. And for me, as a, as a policy person, I like to hear from people where they are and then take it up to my capital, which is Harrisburg, um, and, and let people know this is what's going on in our communities. We can hear all these things that are going on, we see all these things on the TV, but these are the real stories of the people that we interact with, and these are the people that we're here to serve. And so for me, service is the piece. That's the thing that I took away from, from being in, in many of these panels, that for me, I want to serve, and I want to take my voice and my experiences, the experiences of the people I serve, uh, to the highest level. And so for right now, that's Harrisburg. Um, I have aspirations to go higher than that, and I claim them because I think it's important for people to know uh, that you have aspirations and where you're going, because you never know also who can help you. Um, so I'm excited to share with you some of the work we're doing in Pennsylvania. We have some very innovative things that don't take any money. So we do not have money for health equity work in Pennsylvania. That's something that is disappointing to me, but I refuse to let that uh, stop our work. Um, and so that's something I think we can all talk about as well. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here and hear from you all, the, the audience and the panel as well, about how we're going to achieve health equity uh, and eliminate health disparities in a generation. I would also like to thank um, Congresswoman Kelly for having me here. Um, I, I spoke to Ray before the panel and I said, um, I'm the activist on the panel, so please, um, I'm, not, I'm just gonna say what I have to say and ask for forgiveness later, right? So, um, as, a, as an activist, uh, how many of you all um, on November 9th or November 10th woke up saying, this is wonderful, this is great? This is, this is gonna be a great four years for us. Okay, great, I'm in a right, I'm good, good company, right? Okay, so I've been asked to be on this panel and I'm real, real, right? We're, we're not, we're here at nine o'clock in the morning so we came here to hear the real, right? So um, mental health is serious, right? It's real for us. Um, and we are facing a crisis when it comes to healthcare, but our mental health. And what we, and I appreciate my wonderful uh, medical professionals um, on, on the panel, so they can also let me know uh, what I should know and what I should be saying or not be saying, but physical health is important, but our mental health impacts our physical health, right? And so we as black and brown people, we tend to forget that we need to take care of our mind and take care of our soul and our spirit so that we can make sure that we are whole beings and we can do what we are charged to do on this planet, right? So I am with the Black Women's Health Imperative, and so men, I'm not leaving you out because uh, many of you all were birthed from a black woman, but black women, <laughs> let's talk about the realness of being a black woman in mental health here, right? So I've been on a couple of panels and everyone knows exactly what I'm gonna say, so I'm not gonna start, I'm just gonna wait for a question on it to go for, uh, further into it. But as black women, we are faced with a lot. We have the world on our shoulders. We have this black women syndrome that we should do it all and we should be all and we shouldn't say no. And we are dealing with intersectionality. I'm sure everyone, everyone or hopefully everyone has heard about this, but we're dealing with racism, sexism, and classism, right? And that impacts who we are as a person, right? And that impacts how we can be there for our loved ones, for the community, and for the nation. I always say, black women make this world go round. Ain't I right, sisters? Yes, I am, <laughs> right? So I like to say, and I've said this on the panel earlier, that as a black woman, I wake up to movements. 
I am by definition and by default political, right? So when we're talking about our mental health, we need to be clear that we need to rise up, right? And still our rise is the theme. We need to rise up and tell those people up on the hill, tell the people up at our state capitol that I do matter. My mental health matters. So when you're taking away my health care, you're taking away my ability to access mental health, which sometimes I neglect myself from getting, but you don't have the right to tell me that I shouldn't have. Because that's a pre-existing condition that I am now gonna be charged for, charged more for, and being black in America means I'm being charged more for my health care anyways, right? So we need to make sure that we not only think about our health, but we think about the policies that impact our health. And so I think I would be remiss if I'm a policy director and policy expert up here to say that we should make sure our voices are heard at the polls. And when it's not voting time, midterm election, make sure you remember when it's not voting time, that we make sure we call those offices that we stop by. We are here in DC for ALC. So we should not be forgetting about what's on the hill and our ability to walk up there and call and say, you will listen to me, I will be heard. While black and brown lives might, may not matter to you, they matter to me, and they're gonna matter at the poll. Thank you very much. Well, after that, I'm ready to trade in my shoes and, and put on some <laughs> I, I need some running shoes. I'm ready to run to the hill right now. <laughs> Again, um, I, I'd like to echo the other panelists um, and, and really thank Congresswoman Kelly for the invitation. The year was absolutely fabulous in, in preparation. Um, as a pharmacist, I, I can tell you uh, my entire career has not been the traditional pharmacist that you would ever think of. Uh, from day one, uh, I, I began to practice inside of a physician's office. Uh, it was an academic practice, but even today, uh, as of this week, I was still right there with, with my colleagues in our Department of Family Medicine. And it gave me a perspective around what should we be doing because you know, every time they prescribe a medication, you know, statistics would tell us that about you know, a few months later, many people are not taking the medication. Many people cannot afford to take that medication. Uh, there are side effects to the medication. And so as part of my career, um, and being in an academic environment, I began getting involved in clinical trials. And, and, and in my, at least in my institution, I was the first um, pharmacist ever to, to be a, a, a principal investigator for clinical trials at that institution. And so, you know, they said, well, the pharmacists can't do that. And I said, well, why not? Um, and they said, okay, well, let's do it. And so, you know, we engaged in two clinical trials. And as we engaged in, in far more, I really began to understand that we really don't have the immersion of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, minorities, uh, I hate to use that word, but you know, it's a common word I think we can all relate to, um, people of different ethnic backgrounds and diversities. And, and so as I began getting more involved, uh, I got involved with uh, people at our Moscow Cancer Center and really looked across the country and found that you know, in any given day, any given time when a clinical trial is going on, we have less than 5% of the people in that trial who are actually um, people of, of ethnic diversity and background. And uh, a few years ago, there was a medication that came on the market by the name of Bidil. Don't want to start that conversation today, but it was the first medication ever approved on the basis of race. And even within the African American uh, health community, we really began to have a, a very significant discussion. But the thing I would like to share with you all today, um, we need uh, with healthcare right now and, and, and clinical research is, is taking on more of a genomic and molecular and cellular uh, direction more than we've ever done before. And as I've gotten involved in that very heavily, I'm realizing more and more that we need to make sure that we have our imprint, we have our fingerprint, we have our DNA print in these clinical studies. You, all of you right now, when you see commercials on TV, you're beginning to hear words like personalized medicine, precision medicine. You're beginning to hear more of that come out. You're seeing testimony within the commercial talking about how they went and found a biomarker that made that person eligible to take a medication. Well, guess what? If we don't have enough of us in that clinical study, we just don't, we, we won't be able to participate with that. So we really need greater immersion. And the second point I will make very quickly, uh, as I've continued on my career, uh, really getting involved in medical and mobile technology. Uh, I think Dr. Robinson said it very well. I, I'm finding that technology can be a, a, a pathway to actually overcoming many health disparities. You know, right now, if I can get this in the hands of, of anybody in the community, 
I can very quickly assess where they are with their health and get that information to the proper uh, health care provider without them ever having to leave the community. And so I'll be talking, uh, I hope to engage a lot more conversation around technology. Uh, we, you know, we have to meet people where they are in communities and I think we're developing a platform that will allow that to happen. Thank you very much. I just want to take a quick moment to remind our panelists two minutes. I promise to give you some time to talk in the questions. Uh, but, uh, we want to uh, we want to give you all time to respond to the salient issues today. As I look at these bios and the presentations, I'm the obvious underachiever on the panel here today. <laughs> and for any of you out there who feel you haven't achieved enough in your life, who knows you could end up on a panel? Um, <laughs> um, I've worked in kidney care now since 1991, and I can tell you that when you look at the African American community, it is so disparately uh, affected by that disease, and the Congressional Black Caucus has been our champion for those of us who work in kidney disease. There is no other group on the Hill that represents us more aggressively and more staunchly. And so we, we have great thanks to watch for you. And for Congresswoman Kelly, there are 534 people that work on that Hill over there that need to hear your voice, man. <laughs> um, you may wonder, why is, the, why is the one white guy on the panel here talking about kidney disease and chronic care? When I walk into a dialysis facility, I'm often the only white face in the room, okay? The disparity in how that disease affects the black community is, is just overwhelming. And it's where I've spent the vast majority, well, almost all of my professional life. And I can tell you when you walk in and you have the privilege of people putting their health and their survival really in your hands, it's an honor that's very, very hard to, to describe and the, the burden that is on us to do a good job. And when you look at the people who sit in those chairs, one sixth of them will die every year. One sixth. How many people in the room here have had a relative or loved one or friend on dialysis? Right. It, it, it's a life altering thing, isn't it? It changes their life in a way that is just so impossible to believe. And the support that families give is, is part of what keeps these folks alive. And I met a gentleman out in the lobby earlier who had been evaluated to give a kidney to a relative. Now, because of his own health issues, he wasn't able to, to be a donor. But think of the greatness of that act, just the willingness to go forward and offer someone a kidney. And I, I encourage you all to write to your Congress people and ask them to support these bills that support your health, because the disparity really is overwhelming. There are about oh, 450,000 people with end-stage renal disease in the United States, which means if they don't have a transplant or don't have dialysis, they will die, okay? Huge dis disparate proportion of that is African Americans. I had the great pleasure during my training to work with Dr. Larry Agadova, who is at the NIH, and his particular interest is why is it so disparate? What is it that causes kidney disease to have such a disproportionate effect on the African American community? And after hundreds of millions of dollars and many years of, researches, of research, I can give you the answer in two words. Nobody knows, okay? which is a little bit daunting. And so we focus on chronic care and keeping people alive. And I noticed there's a um, table over here that has HIV medication. Now, when I was in my training, that diagnosis was a death sentence. And now we have people that are alive for 20, 30 years because of the advances. And if you think about uh, those, you know, I live here in D.C., and when you think about those campaigns on the metro saying, know your test result, know your diagnosis, okay? That's what's keeping people alive. It's community people like you who are getting your community to get their ostrich head out of the sand and face what the health issues are and to take care of themselves. And it's a community effort. And, and nobody more than the Congressional Black Caucus has pushed that in American health care. So we're incredibly grateful. Thank, thank you, Dr. Mahoney. We, we, we promise to get to get back to you. I, That's I appreciate my two minute spiel. <laughs> thank you very much. And Dr. Brown. Well, this is like the um, Oscars or the Emmys, and you sort of ring that bell. But I have something to say, and I just heard one of our panelists say, "Our voices need to be heard." And so, coming from the National Medical Association, I would like to tell you about what we are focused on. And for my vision as the 118th president, 
I am going to create a national action plan for health equity. And that action plan, because we've been talking about health disparities 15 years ago, so now it's time to stop talking. It's time to get up off of our rears and to do. And so I have created a collaborative approach that is going to involve and is involving all of our professional organization, our policymakers, our legislators, our community advocate, our faith-based organization, young, old, green, purple, whatever, um, taking away all of the racism, sexism, gender, I just say all of those things, we are coming together to create this national action plan for health equity. It's not about talking, it's about doing. And the first phase of this was held on Wednesday here at the caucus where we had panelists coming from the professional organizations to indicate that they are willing to work with the National Medical Association to make this happen. So that's the first phase. We have the nurses and the pharmacists and the dentists and the lawyers and the media and the uh, industry and um, the, the associations all engaged. We're gonna move this to our second phase, which will be held in a health colloquium in March here in Washington, where we will have our Hill Day, we will involve our national, state, and local legislators, we will have our social organizations, our Greek organizations, faith-based organizations, and of course, bringing back uh, communities, because this is about us, and I also want to indicate that I did have young people on my panel. I have the Student National Medical Association engaged, and I want to engage other organizations. I stepped into one of the uh, rooms and heard a bunch of young women talking, and I was just so excited, left my card, but I want to engage them in this. This is about us doing it for us. We need to get off the dime and do this. And my last thing, I see you over there with the ring. I'm getting bell. ready, Dr. Brown. I'm getting ready. I'm getting I do, ready. I do have just a couple of things to say. As a common theme that, theme that has gone through this, we talked about clinical trials. The National Medical Association has been engaged in not only training providers, but training consumers about how to get engaged. Because we're all out here taking medicines and we have no clue how many of people look like us was in that study. But we take it every day because your doctor said so. Uh, policy, really, really important. The sugar, that's, so, that's lifestyle. We need to make sure that we're going to have a healthy lifestyle we're going to increase our life. And then I'm going to end this with two things. Technology is really important, and that's what we want to get engaged in. But every one of us in this room, before you leave today, call your senator and tell them that Cassidy Graham is bunk. Throw it out. <laughs> I wake up some days and I have that attitude, but I'm one of those old women, so I can say that. Please, this is critical. And then in 2018, please make sure you are registered, your neighbor, anybody down the street, whatever. Get them to the polls. It matters. We have to get back into owning our country. Thank you very much. You're not the only activist up here now, Dr. Ham. We, we, yeah, hold up. All right, I am going to um, respectfully request that we keep our answers to these questions compressed. Many of you, uh, many of our panelists, that is, uh, they submitted questions uh, on topics that are salient to them that I think would be be very beneficial for all of us to hear. Um, the only way we can achieve that is if everyone's questions are as tight as possible. Amen. All right. So uh, I have a question that I would like to ask first. The future of medicine is precision and personalization. I think we all understand and agree with that. Uh, there have been many discoveries in the genetic space, uh, discoveries in therapeutics, uh, te new technological breakthroughs that have helped to advance the cause of medicine. However, perhaps no issue is more personal or precise to one's health outcomes than the impact of issues of social justice on communities of color. From food insecurity and pediatric asthma disparities to wage inequality and the physiologic damage 
caused by chronic exposure to systemic racism. Communities of color are suffering not only from diseased bodies, but from diseased societies. So I have two questions for our panelists. In round robin fashion, yes or no, number one, do you believe it is the responsibility of healthcare professionals to lead the fight for social justice in marginalized communities? And number two, what are you doing to see to it that systemic inequality is addressed in your academic or professional role? I'll begin with you, Dr. Smith. Um, so the first is, do I think that health providers should be? Actively engaged, leading in issues of social justice in America. I think that they should be engaged. I don't know if they should be leading, um, and I have a reason for that, but they should definitely be heavily engaged. That's your first question. That is my first question. Second? The second question is, what are you doing in your role, professionally or academically, to advance that issue? I go on TV every week and, and, and try to give people the power um, to be able to, to have grasp and control of their own health destiny. I don't believe in resignation. And I try to empower people to realize that by making some steps, changing your, your behavior, by questioning the establishment, you can control more of your health destiny. Yeah. So uh, my answer to your first question is yes. Uh, I don't think that anyone should back away from a mantle of leadership, but I think leadership looks different for different people. Uh, so I could say everyone in this room could be a leader for change um, in addressing what I consider the social determinants of health. In terms of uh, what I do, I think uh, working in Pennsylvania, uh, where we have tremendous health disparities, uh, we have a, a, bit, a huge rural population, uh, and as such, uh, they have their own set of, of challenges that they are undergoing. But it makes it very difficult to have conversations with our, legislat our legislators because for them, when we talk disparity, they think it's only a black person issue. We don't have black people in rural areas, so let's not talk about it. So we're talking about it in Pennsylvania. We're, we're calling it out. Um, and the other thing we're doing is we're working with our partners. So uh, something that, that I think is a challenge is a, when we talk about social determinants of health and we talk about housing or transportation, each of these agencies or however they exist in each of your communities has, has some type of committee or someone who's looking at issues of equity. Unfortunately, they're usually working on it by themselves or kind of in a silo. So if you can get whoever that person is at each of those agencies at a table and talking about it, when you pull your resources and put those together and talk about what you're doing, people are making steps. But we're more powerful together than we are just one on one. -on -one. So I think creating community, creating a sense of teamwork, uh, and working with folks kind of across the aisle and across agencies uh, really allows you to address each of these social determinants. Two minutes, or two and a half minutes. Maybe, maybe one, maybe one. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, so my answer would be uh, providers leading, no. Um, I would say that it's really uh, the patient, the people, the, the uh, patient advocates, um, and we witnessed that um, with the last repeal effort. Mm. It, was, uh, it was the patient advocates, the, co the community advocates that came and, and really demanded that they be heard and, and, and demanded that the impacts, uh, the impact of the bill be known by, by patients, by consumers. And at that point is when we saw a rising up and a, a huge pushback on our policymakers. So I think it's the people, uh, the people in this audience and the other uh, consumers uh, that are gonna be there to really lead the charge. Um, what am I doing? I'm doing just this, being an advocate I am uh, making my voice heard. I am being very annoying to the people on the Hill, um, particularly those who are conservative, to let them know that what you do does impact other people. And it's not just black and brown people, it's also white people that are impacted. So your constituents, your voters are impacted by the decisions that you make. Um, in addition to that, I, I speak on wonderful panels with great people like this, and um, I'm also an affiliate um, uh, political commentator on um, national um, public radio station. So I, I make sure that I am educating and bringing awareness to our community because I think through that education, people like us are empowered to do more and ready to lead the charge. Okay, there, there we go, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I think my, uh, for question number one, I, I, I take a, a little bit of a different approach. I think it needs to be a very collaborative approach. 
but you need to have the right people leading each part of what that collaboration represents. So you need to have um, healthcare leaders who are, who are actively engaged. You need people from the community. Why, well, very often, when you begin to attack a problem, it can't just be one group or one person. You need a leader of every segment to attack the problem from every angle that you can. And so I tend to think of more of a council approach almost, where you do have healthcare clinicians, you have people from the community, you have um, you know, clinical social workers, whatever it might be, whatever is needed to, to address that part. Um, and on, on the second part, one thing that I've been really big on has been pipeline programming, getting into the educational system, uh, starting with education at a very young age, getting people engaged. You know, very often, you, you look into the eyes of a of an eight or a 12 year old somewhere in that, in that span and, and, and they are very intelligent and they're very bright and, and exposure and, and not just one time exposure. You know, I like the Great American Teach-In Day. We need Great American Teach-In Decade. You know, we need people like me going out there and continually bringing people along to help them engage in and knowing what healthcare is all about, knowing what community is all about and then helping them to express who they are and optimizing who they are as individuals. And so, uh, you know, as an academician, I believe that pipelining, um, beginning at a very young age, and then bringing people along and, act, and getting them engaged in an appropriate manner is one of the most important things we can do. Well, the answer to your first question, why ES all capitals, okay? Um, with regard to what I'm doing, uh, I, I think nothing is more important than, you sort of stole my thunder a little bit, no, nothing is more vital than education. And a lot of it is very basic, simple stuff. For example, we tell every diabetic, at least once a month, take your shoes off and have somebody look at your feet. Okay, something that simple. What are diabetics afraid of? Going blind, ending up on dialysis, or losing a limb. And in this country, if you live in the rural southeast, the overwhelming likelihood is that you will have no intervention to save your limb prior to having it amputated. Okay? If you live here in Washington, D.C., where we have loads of health care available, and you have an intensive physician, the overwhelming likelihood is you'll have the interventions to keep your, keep your limb. Well, if we can bypass that responsibility and pass that knowledge and power onto the patients and say, you can do what you need to do for, for our women, get your mammograms. Uh, for, for people who are at risk for infections, be tested. Uh, empower people to look after their own health. I think that's the biggest thing that Yes, to the first um, question, but it is a collaborative approach. Just as I've indicated, this national action plan for health equity, jump on board, that's what it's all about. What I have been doing, educating and training, that's what my small business is all about. That's what I do day in and day out, whether I'm paid or not paid, because I believe you educate and empower those to go out and do for themselves. And I should say the last part is mentoring. I love and believe that somebody has to follow us, somebody has to keep this family going, and it's all of you out there, as well as these youngsters on the page. Wonderful. Um, looking at our time, I think I would like to prepare for audience questions soon. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people in our audience have conceived of a question they might want to ask? This will get me a, a sense for how much more rope I can give our panelists here. <laughs> okay, so I tell you what, yeah, let's just take questions. While you all are queuing for questions, I do have one more question that I would like to ask. Uh, my wife is, uh, she's the better Dr. Bignall. She is uh, also a healthcare professional. Uh, mental health provider. She's a child psychologist. And uh, Dr. Gamble uh, touched on uh, the issue of mental health uh, amongst African American women. I was wondering if uh, the ladies on our panel uh, could provide some very brief comments on that while our uh, uh, audience members queue for, queue for questions. Sure. Sure. So, uh Mental health, uh, mental health parity is something that I think our country uh, needs to strive to. Uh, just as much as we, we talk about health equity, we need to make sure that we're always talking about mental health when we talk about, uh, about health equity. Um, for women, I think uh, 
like Sister Gamble said, we're, we're always trying to keep everyone else's balls in the air, make sure people are fed, going to school, got their homework done, uh, doing all these things for other people, uh, that at the end of the day, when it comes time to take care of mental health, we're just tired. Um, and you're just lucky if you can just go to sleep and then when you get in the bed you can't sleep anyway. Uh, and so I think we need to do a better job when we talk about activating the patient. Everyone in this room is a patient, every single person. And so we all need to be activated to say, how do I take care of myself? What is it that I do for me to make sure that I'm okay? For me, it's coming to CBC. This is a thing for me that gets me all fired up and I go back to Harrisburg and I'm like, okay, I'm fired up, I got issues, let's work. This is what does it for me. Um, but you've gotta figure out what is that thing that renews your soul that keeps you going and that, and that lets you take care of yourself. Uh, I think if we th talk about healthcare in a formal sense, I don't know that we have the infrastructure uh, because your wife hasn't been able to clone herself yet <laughs> um, to take care of the mental health issues that plague our community. Uh, where I live, I don't know of a uh, child psychologist that is a woman of color that I could refer so many people to, um, but I know a lot of people who deal with mental health issues in their families and are seeking treatment, whether it's outpatient, inpatient, and we just don't have those resources available. Once again, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, so so I, I will come at it from a, a policy perspective, right, um, and just tell you a little bit about the, the research. The research has shown that we are more stressed out than ever, mm -hmm. right? We are, particularly after November, we are more stressed out than ever, than ever. And there's research out there that has shown that perceived or actual discrimination has increased um, our risk of mental health issues. 7.9% of African Americans are now being diagnosed with PTSD, right? And that's just the ones that are being diagnosed that are seeing a physician. But I wanted to come up here to talk about the impact of stress on our lives. And everyone knows from panel to panel, I've been talking about stress, it is real. And after seeing what has happened in Charlottesville and see what's coming out of our, our White House, we are completely stressed out. And that is impacting us, that's giving us depression, anxiety, PTSD, and when you're talking about black women, there are a couple of policy issues that impact our mental health. So let me run through just a few things that black women may have to face, right? So when we go to work, we're told, we're told to work twice as hard, if not 10 times harder, than people that don't look like us, but then when we get our paycheck, it's 64 cents to the dollar that the white man is getting paid, right? So, and then we're seeing our loved ones, our black men, being shot on the street with no vindication no accountability and they're being killed by cops and there's nothing that we're being told we're training up our children to be educated and well informed but they still can't get into elite schools right so this is the statistics that we're facing right we get we know that we're not getting our due and we're stressed we're connecting we're seeing things on TV on social media that's really driving up driving our stress level getting us depressed our mental health is being impacted but we're not being able to see the providers that we need to deal with those issues so we need to think about some solutions that can impact us right so physical activity is one thing we got the wonderful girls track over there walk it out support systems sister circles, we need to learn how to meditate, we need to learn how to be there for our black women so that they don't have to feel like they have to be the strong black woman and they don't have to do it all. Okay, I see Ray giving me the side no, eye, no, so no, I'm, I'm gonna... Just, it's no side uh, eye, just appreciation. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm 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 wrap it up in a second, but even even the, the even yeah even the black men even the black men in in this in, in, in this audience we we know what it's like the people of color black and brown we know what it's like to deal with discrimination on our job or at home and we're not realizing the impact that it has on our mental health but we need to have a check we need to have accountability partners to say are you okay and not just say yeah I'm okay I'm blessed I'm highly favored thank you I understand that but we need to be able to say I need to go see someone I need to talk I need to let someone know that I need help and no is okay mm -hmm. yes I, again it's hard to follow if you get all the answers that's there but I want to say that I agree the stress is very important because that stress impacts not only our mental health but our physical health and we have not connected those dots there are things with our heart disease and, and our diabetes and our cancers and all of the other things that's really important, that's really coming from the stress that we have and being the superwoman that we have been told that we have to be because again, we work 10 times harder and get paid 10 times less. Uh, 
that's adding to the stress that's there. And our providers are not recognizing that in women as much as we should. And so I will stop there because we got a line. Well, I'll tell you what, Dr. Kelly, you're gonna have to bring us back next week. We, we, <laughs> there is obviously a wealth of things, not only for us to learn, but things for us to say. And it's rare that we have forums like this, we have an opportunity to do so. Thank you very much to our panelists for uh, their responses to the uh, prepared questions. I'll start uh, with your question. Would you just uh, state your name and your question for the panel? Sure, my name is Doc <clears throat> Dr. Neva Lubin Johnson. I'll have the honor and the privilege of following D Dr. Brown as the 119th president of the National Medical Association next August. My question is a bit more specific about advocacy. I'd like the panelists to answer the question of what organization do you belong to that supports our communities, be it a professional organization such as NMA and or a sorority, the Lynx, 100 Black Men, et cetera, and have you financially supported a candidate? Because if we want candidates to win, not only do we have to vote for them, for those of us who, can, who have the ability to give them a little something, something, we need to do that also. And so I'd like for uh, each panelist to answer th that question. I Thank you. I tell her to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> it is noted that Congresswoman Kelly did not plant that question. Uh, it, she did not plant that question. Who would like to respond to that? Well, sure, I'll start. Well, yes, I'm a member of uh, professional, obviously, the National Medical Association, my professional society, the American uh, Society of Clinical Oncology, American College of Physicians. Um, going down the line, I, I have not paid my dues in the Public Health Association, but I am an active member. Don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> you only have so many dollars to go around. Um, and in social organizations, I'm a, a member of a sorority. I am a member of my church. I am a member of a local. Uh, I guess it's uh, an empowerment group, a group of black women that was called AWARE, African American Women Accessing Resources for Empowerment. And we had focused on three areas, education, economic uh, in, uh, security, and uh, again, advocacy. And that was, we supported candidates. We actively took a seat at the table by passing out those dollars and we actively support, and I'm sure you've heard from me, I am always out here behind the candidate. I give, I, I march for them, and I'm coming from the military, so of course I could not do that when I was in a uniform, but took it off, and hey. Um. <laughs> Can I have a male answer that question also? Sure. Brief. Is there a gentleman on the panel who'd like to answer? So, um, I'm really pleased to be on the panel, actually, with both of you. I'm, I'm a very active member of the National Pharmaceutical Association, uh, NPHA, uh, also ASHP, APHA. I mean, there's a whole litany of, of uh, pharmacy-related organizations. Uh, community, I'm part of two fraternities. Um, one, <coughs> Sigma Phi Five, uh, the Brule. We are very, very active. Just had a meeting Wednesday evening about our social justice that we're actively engaged in. And also, I will tell you that I'm also part of, of multiple um, um, men's uh, Bible groups. And one thing that we have, uh, have done uh, in, in both groups is really how can we be better fathers, how can we be better husbands, how can we actually support women to uh, alleviate some of what, what, what was just talked about. So um, I think I'm very, very engaged. And politically, I'm, I'm, you know, they've been asking me to run for office now for about 10 years. I say I just play a politician on TV. I'm not really a politician, but I engage in our, our state capital uh, all the time. And I always have, but I've learned I have to be careful. My wife is a federal judge, and so lately I've had to be a little bit more cautious about about um, you know, some of the some of the activities I engage in. But nevertheless, I educate all of our politicians, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. Thank you. If your wife is a federal judge, we need you to keep her safe, please. So um, I would yeah. like to add Real that, quick. so speaking as Lauren Robinson, not as Deputy Secretary Robinson, because Deputy Secretary Robinson does not make contributions, uh, but Lauren Robinson supports people with uh, with my voice and with my pocketbook. And, well, I 
this wallet, e-wallet. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, technology. Um, so I would say to the folks in the audience a couple of things. I think it's very important for the younger folks to know. Um, when I was in my residency training, I really wanted to get involved and active and do these things. And the advice I got was, right now, just do good for where you are, and one day you'll get there, and then you can contribute, or then you can lead, or then you can do those things. And I would, I would advise you, and pardon me, I'm getting hoarse, to, to be involved where you are and to think about how you can take a leadership level or make a contribution or anything that you can do. You might not be able to make a contribution right now, but you can make phone calls. And then one day when you get to where you're going, you can make a contribution. Or maybe you're gonna make a contribution of $5, but get involved. It, I, I keep talking to my sisters, and, and I'm involved with a lot of national organizations and local organizations, and the local organizations have power. And if it's just your group of friends, and maybe you don't have a name for it, but you're like, you know what, this is a candidate, there's a young woman of color, there's a Latina over here, I'm Latina, she's running, we're gonna get together and we're gonna make a contribution as a group. That's just as powerful, and you never know where that can go. And so don't wait until tomorrow, or till the next day, or 40 years from now, because you feel like you're going to be wherever you are financially. There is something that everyone in this room can do. Um, and I'm a little fired up now, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, can I tag on to that by saying Very that quickly now, Dr. I suggest contribute. We need young people to stand up and run. Mm -hmm. Run for office, local, mm -hmm. state, federal, run. This is the, the time is now for our millennials to really stand up and run for office. Amen. Yes, ma'am. My question is connected. My name is Melissa Robinson, Kansas City, Missouri, and I work for the Black Health Care Coalition, where we look at access to care issues, health promotion, and advocacy. One of the things that we're finding is that um, helping people to raise their voices in different spaces. So, Dr. Gamble, can you talk about the civic engagement crisis that we're in um, and how, as African Americans, we don't connect registering to vote to voting, to serving on juries, to you know, um, selecting judges, all of that is all connected, right? And um, while we've been somewhat effective in helping people to raise their voice um, with their clinicians about um, their chronic disease states, but we often don't connect civically with where we live and place and how, what are some strategies we can use to really ignite civic engagement from the very local level um, to raise up to the collective? Right, right. I will keep this brief, yes, Ray. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things we do at the Black Women's Health Imperative is we tell people to vote like your health matters. Right? So I think now, actually, we're starting to recognize, and, and I had a panel yesterday on this, on black women rising, marching, and resisting, that now we're starting to recognize that people are popping up all over the place, waking up to movements, right? Starting their own movements. Technology has been key, right? That social media, as I tell you to disconnect from at certain times, has um, been able to let us really talk about how and why it's important to vote. And what we're seeing right now, I mean, we have a clear, 45 has given us the platform right now to tell people, just say 45 or President Trump. And right there, black people are re really now getting motivated to vote now. And so I think it takes collaborating and coalitions and letting people know how it connects to your health care, how it connects to where you live, how it connects to your paycheck, and how it connects to just life, period. And that's when you'll start to see people say, okay, ding, I'm seeing it. But right now, it's, it's just 45 has made it so real and relevant for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, Good morning. Um, my name is Tiffany Ford. I work as a policy analyst for health equity and health reform in Chicago. I actually currently live in and am from the south side of Chicago. So my question is for you, Dr. Smith. Um, you mentioned the, the sugar sweetened beverage tax. Um, and it sounded like you were a little critical of it. I am uh, definitely a critic of it myself. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about how you feel it could be better structured so that it doesn't disproportionately impact low income people and people of color. Thank you. So the premise, um, about 32 or 33 states have this sugar or sweet tax. And the premise of it, at least claimed, was that um, the idea was that these particular sugar sweetened beverages, SSBs, uh, contribute to obesity. And obesity, as we know, contributes to heart disease, to diabetes, and other kinds of illnesses. And the idea was, if we put a, a tax on it, we'll be able to decrease the amount of consumption. Well, there are a couple of issues uh, with that thinking, it's not exactly linear. First of all, um, if you look historically at these what I call punitive taxes, 
uh, look at cigarettes, for example. Uh, if you look at punitive taxes, th there has not been, by and large, convincing evidence um, that you are going to dramatically change the behavior of the consumer. The behavior you will consume is going someplace where you don't have to have that tax. Okay, so you know, particularly in Chicago, you know, people are now saying, okay, I'll go to Indiana to buy. It's not going to stop them from drinking Coke. Now, listen, let me be clear. I'm very much against SSBs. I'm very much against you know manufacturers putting all this unnecessary sugar in our product. So I am against it. However, I think that um, you're missing the boat when you think just taxing, particularly. So the idea is a penny an ounce. So you know, if you have a 20 ounce soda, it's now going to be 20 cents more. Um, and then they claim that it's supposed to go to health care programs. Well, what, what health care programs? No one is saying specifically what the health care programs are. I was reading an article yesterday where in Chicago, in Cook County, they were upset because the judge um, had delayed the implementation of the tax. And the, the Cook County board said, we now have a shortfall of $30 million because we were planning on this money, and we got delayed by several months. Well. Why is that in your budget? I mean, why are, you, why are you trying to balance your budget on a tax that should be going to healthcare programs, okay? So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat cynical about taxes in general, but particularly this tax. If you said to me, we're gonna take these taxes and do education programs in schools, we're gonna help you know, women get breast cancer screening who can't get it. If you give me specific targets, I'm on board with you. But this kind of generic, we're going to tax them to help health care programs, well, who's accountable? Who's supervising this? The last thing I want to say is this. The question also becomes, the consumer gets hurt and not the manufacturer, right? So with cigarettes, they did an excise tax. I won't get into the different types of taxes, but with, with cigarettes, they did more of an excise tax. This is a sales tax. So it's a pass-through tax. So once again, rather than going after the companies that are unnecessarily sweetening these products, and saying you must do X, Y, Z, they're passing it on to the retailers, retailers pass it on to consumers, it ends up on the, on, the, on the little guy. And once again, my issue is this, my issue is when you look at communities of color or low income in rural areas all over the, all over the country, these places have food deserts, okay? Mm -hmm. They have food deserts, they have income challenges. And so now you're saying to them, a woman or a husband or a family already struggling you're now saying we're going to increase by 20 cents, a six pack to be 60 cents. We're going to increase this cost because you're buying this. Well, what's our alternative? So there are a lot of issues. I think the best thing to do is people to sit down and talk about it and figure out ways to specifically talk about how to tap manufacturers, how to make it less uh, of the penalty to, to consumers, and then where to spend it. Show me exactly where you want to spend it. Thank you. Your question. Good morning, my name is Alia Shabazz, and I'm not a health professional, but I have an interest in the topic, primarily because of my family's um, health issues and challenges that we faced, mental health, as well as um, issues with um, lupus and other illnesses. So my issue is the idea of the focus on prevention. At one point in my career, I worked for the Centers for Disease Control, and at that time, the director um, made it um, change the name or added the word prevention to the title. And what I never hear in these forums is the idea of the focus on prevention. And so, well, Dr. Smith, you touched on it a little bit with regard to the sugar. What are we doing locally to um, encourage and educate our citizens with regard to how to prevent these illnesses or diseases that we continue to face? Because it's not just about um, Who's on, who lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's about who's in our capital houses, uh, how we address and advocate for ourselves there first before we even get to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because that person changes every four years. Yeah. I'll, I'll have Dr. Mahoney uh, take that question. Thank you. Uh, when I was in medical school in the early 80s, they said, quote, preventive medicine never saved a nickel. And the reason was it wasn't done right. It was done very poorly. Um, you've hit the nail on the head as to what's going to be the course of medicine going forward. We have to have medicine where we take care of patients and you sort of have one-stop shopping. That there is sort of like the old days where, you know, Marcus Welby did everything from A to Z for a patient. Well, 
you don't want me performing your heart surgery because it'll be my first and your last surgery. <laughs> but, um, you do want me to be aware, as your primary doctor, that you have a heart issue. Right. And what can we do to keep you well? What can I do today to keep you out of the hospital tomorrow? Because hospitals represent failure. No, and that's not to disparage hospitals. It means we've allowed your health condition to progress to the point that you need to be hospitalized. And so it goes back to crossing the T's and dotting the I's and saying, if you have diabetes, we're gonna look at your feet every month and we're gonna follow your blood pressure and we're going to make sure that the pharmacist reviews your medications periodically and sees if you don't have interactions. And this whole idea of a medical home that someone is responsible for your health care from A to Z, not just, I'm not gonna look after your kidneys and this guy's gonna look after your heart and that person's gonna look after your, you know, your diabetes, that you, you have a quarterback for your health care. That's the future of prevention. And a brief um, comment from Dr. Just, 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 just very quickly, um, one thing that we're doing with technology, again, I'd like to, how many people right now have a mobile phone? So, we'll, so I, um, like as part of my American Heart work, uh, we commissioned a study and we found out that you know, quite a few uh, people in, in many communities have phones. And so we, we're working right now with, with multiple companies to use the phone as a technology informer for the patient mm -hmm. so that they can always know what is going on with their health and it will inform them because they're checking their text and email all the time. We want them checking their health and then providing that information to the entire medical home team, whether it be the physician, the specialist, the pharmacist, social worker, whoever it might be, so that we can intervene much quicker before we get to the point of having a problem. We're using it to assess medication efficacy because if, you're, if the medication is not doing what it should, then it's not helping you. And so I just wanted to make sure we uh, kind of mentioned that, that we're proactively using proactive analytics in turn to help do prevention. That's right. That prevention is really critical in terms of educating um, the patient, but education, screening, and that is keeping up with the screening guidelines that we have available that we know really helps and doing that to get early detection because then that can <coughs> cut down on the diseases. But it's all about education and that's what I'm about. Wonderful. Thank you. Congresswoman staff has held up the five minute sign. So we'll consider this this lightning round, all right? Um, so if you could ask your question very quickly, and we'll encourage one panelist to respond very quickly as well. Awesome, Go thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Perry. I'm the current president of the National Dental Association. And uh, this has been very inter uh, inter exciting for me. But I do have a couple of thoughts in terms of oral health. So we know that there are oral health disparities there, uh, especially in children, and we know for seniors, uh, we know about oral cancer, um, and, the, and the statistics are pretty much daunting. There's been a lot of conversation about the integration of oral health into primary care. Can you share what you think that model would look like as a solution to reducing health disparities and eventually achieving uh, health equity in our underrepresented communities? I wonder, Dr. Robinson, if you can take that one. So I think that's a great idea to be really quick about it. I think because the payment structures are different, that would be a, a significant challenge to it. But I think if you can create an integrated and truly medical home and address uh, dental, oral health, physical health, and mental health all in the same place, we would be a much healthier society. So I think that is a way that we need to move toward. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Lenore Coleman. I'm a uh, director of quality for Wise Think Health and uh, president and founder of Healing Our Village. Been taking care of patients with diabetes um, for 36 years. Um, and the thing that I think is so interesting is that we continue to um, talk about all these wonderful things that we're doing, but patients are not still in control of their health. And we as a community are not in control of our community. So we're not recycling black dollars, but we're certainly not empowering patients with the messages and the things that they need, the tools that they need, the digital health tools that they need to know their numbers, but also care about getting better. So in my lifetime, I'm, I'm almost about to retire, folks, so hypertension, that's all I care about. I can answer your question why you have people in black and brown people in your dialysis centers. It's called hypertension and diabetes. So I'd like to know from uh, possibly the, the, the spokesperson from Pennsylvania, because I know a lot about your programs, what are you doing actively in the community potentially to really get empower these patients to take control of right. their blood pressure? 
Thank you. So I think one of the things I've learned in being in Harrisburg is that all the answers are not in Harrisburg. And some of the best uh, solutions are actually community solutions. And I think that ties back to the earlier point that um, it's not in the Department of Health and it's not in doctor's offices that we're going to do this. It's really going to be in our churches, in our Sunday circles, in our friendship circles. Um, and when we talk about uh, nonprofit agencies and organizations that come out of the community that are grassroots organizations and that really engage and know the community better than someone in a suit in Harrisburg, that's what really, really going to make the difference. If we can tell folks this is a simple thing you can do to keep yourself healthy around high blood pressure, we can get it done through our community organization. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jason Marcel, actually um, with uh, Boston Scientific, so I'll be here talking a little bit about some of the things we're doing. But um, I've also been in the healthcare industry for almost 15 years and seen a huge swing in, in the spectrum. One of the things I'd like to ask just anybody on the panel, um, one of the things I think is a top, top down and a bottom up approach, how do we actually get patients? to take ownership of some of their decisions uh, that they're making, you know, absence of genetic issues. But you talk about diabetes, you talk about sugar, you talk about these things. And I used to work, I spent about five years in the infectious disease realm. And you see patients, we're a quick fix society. They want to take a pill for everything. So tell me about your thoughts on the approach of how to get that patient to gain more ownership of the decisions that they're making with things that we can control. Dr. Smith, would you like to take that? Well, I think that a lot of it stems from the interaction with patients. I think that, um, you know, we speak in very high medical ease uh, when we talk to patients, and I think that we need to go to the ground base. We gotta go where people are and meet them where they are. And I think that involving more local community groups, involving churches, I work very actively with Chicago churches, um, just exercise programs. Just, you know, getting them to come out every Saturday morning for 30 minutes and working out with me or my team and then, and then using that as a platform to talk to them about things that they can do. When people see real change in themselves, then they buy into it. But you know, all of us with all our degrees and all of our education experience, just preaching to people, if they don't feel it and can't relate to it, it doesn't make a difference. So, so what I encourage and what I try to do is I try to go to the ground in schools, <clears throat> excuse me, and in churches and give people access to programs that are affordable that they can say, wow, this really, this makes a difference, it makes sense, I can do this, and it becomes infectious. Thank you, thank you, go ahead. Hi, my name is Catherine McKenzie Ziegler, and I'm coming from a corporate human resources perspective. Um, every year, I'm charged with negotiating um, what the insurance plans will look like within a corporate environment, and one of the biggest challenges we face usually, obviously, is rising costs where we have this scale where we go up 14% and the next year it's only a percent. Um, and I realize there's no one here from insurance specifically, but one of the things we're constantly told though is that the prescription drugs are a key driver of that. And things like injectables and things along that line are what's key. And my question in, in all of the healthcare debate is I'm not hearing how either from a clinical policy, how, is it, how are we influenced or how can we influence how those drug prices and drugs that are definitely helpful in some cases, um, how are we influencing that or how can we? And also from the insurance perspective, so how is the clinical as well as the business side all aligning and coming together and what can we do about it? We only have a few moments, but Dr. Sneed, that's your question. Yeah, absolutely. This is a key area I'm very involved in. I'm very happy we have Congresswoman Kelly here. Um, I am a capitalist at heart. I believe people should go out and work hard and make money and you should be paid appropriately. Uh, I thought I would never say it in my lifetime, but it's time for price control in this country um, around medication. Uh, if you all saw the gentleman that, that took a medication and exploded the price by over 2,000, 6,000 percent or whatever it was. Uh, the EpiPen um, problems that we've had. So the exploding cost of medications cannot be controlled by the provider, it cannot be controlled by the community. And if we leave it up to the companies to even privately collude, even with generic prices right now, medications that used to cost $6 per tablet now cost $60 per tablet. And patients have no voice in that, providers have no voice in that. I think it's really time that we take an adequate approach and it must come probably from the top down in terms of legislation that will do something to either cap or, or penalize or something has to happen at that level because until we get that far, virtually everybody in is going to be held a hostage and a prisoner in that, in that realm. Dr. Gamble wanted 10 seconds. You're on the shot clock. 
but okay. Giving you tips. Um, I had the privilege and the honor of working with Elijah Cummings as his Democratic Health Care Council, where I actually initiated the prescription drug affordability investigation that brought Daraprim and Valiant to the table. Uh, and Congresswoman Kelly was on the Oversight Com um, and Government Reform Committee. So uh, there's there's legislation out there and um, transparency. I think this is a great question because medical costs and prescription drug costs. We don't know what we're being charged. There has to be transparency all along the chain. And as a, thank you, as a staffer, hearing from people, from consumers, about their drugs going up, that's how we heard about Daraprim. We had the HIV and AIDS organization call us and say, they just increased my drug from this to that. And so that's when you have to pick up the phone and call and let your legislator, your policymakers know what's going on. And things do happen. Things, if we, if you do become aware because you have wonderful people like Congresswoman Kelly and Congressman um, Elijah Cummings that puts into place these pieces of legislation. But I think we need transparency all along the chain. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panelists this morning for terrific insight. Once again, we want to thank Congresswoman Kelly. Let's give her a round of applause as well for the work that she has done through the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust to advance the issues of health equities in our community. Go and do likewise. We have all heard the charge. It's now our turn to take up the challenge. Thank you all very much. Audra Wilson. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and I'm so happy to see all of you here, and thank you for joining us for our wonderful uh, days of events. But I'd like to bring the Congresswoman to the stage because we are about to embark upon our presentation, the leadership presentation of the Every year, every year the Brain Trust gives three awards, two Congressional Leadership Awards and one Staff Leadership Award to outstanding practitioners, clinicians, advocates, and we want to make sure that not only we recognize their accomplishments, but that we all know who they are too, because they're so very important in this fight. The first award that I'd like to give is, this is my banner, so is to not only an outstanding young woman, and who happens to be my college friend and housemate, so I'm very honored to be able to recognize Ms. Britt Weinstock. Britt has worked in the fields of health policy, public health planning, assessment and evaluation, health financing, and health equity for more than two decades. Dr. Weinstock currently serves as the staff director of the Subcommittee on Primary Health and Retirement on the Senate Health Committee in the office of Senator Bernie Sanders. And in this role, Dr. Weinstock advises Senator Sanders and others on the Subcommittee on a host of issues ranging from prescription drug prices pressing public health issues and community health center funding to efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Prior to this role, Dr. Weinstock was the president of the Health Equity Strategies Group. She also served for nearly 10 years as a director of health policy to the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust in the office of Congresswoman Donna Christensen, so some of you may actually know her from that role. She was responsible there for a very broad range of public health, health policy, and health care issues. She holds her Doctor of Philosophy, Philosophy and Sociology with a co-specialization in medical sociology and social inequality, and a minor in bioethics from Howard University, a master's degree with a concentration in social and public policy from Georgetown, and our beloved alma mater, Bachelor of Arts degree from Bucknell University. So let's give a round of applause to our winner for the year's CBC Health Brain Trust Congressional Staff Leadership Award, Ms. Britt Weinstock.
Thank you, Brent. And now, for the first of our two Congressional Leadership Awards. Isaac Forger is an innovative government relations and public affairs strategist with 20 years of public policy, legislative and regulatory strategy, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> experience. Isaac is currently the Director of Federal Government Affairs and Health Policy at Boston Scientific, one of the world's largest medical device manufacturers. He was formerly a principal at Tarquin, Downs & Young, a leading bipartisan health policy and lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. <coughs> Prior to joining the firm, he was the Director of Federal and State Legislative Affairs for the National Marrow Donor Program where he developed public outreach strategies and various policy initiatives on a broad range of issues impacting blood stem cell transplantation. He served on advisory committees for numerous organizations, including the CBC Foundation, the National Conference of Black Mayors, and the Democratic National Committee. Isaac also served on the board of directors for both the Washington Government Relations Group and Bright Beginnings Incorporated. Let's give a round of applause to our Congressional Leadership Award recipient, Isaac Forger of Boston Science and Health. And now our final recipient is Mr. Jesse Kearns. Jesse is the Director of Global Government Affairs for Amgen Incorporated, a biotechnology company headquartered in California. Amgen is a global leader in researching and developing treatments for cancer, kidney disease, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and other diseases. Throughout his career in health policy, Jesse has focused on issues that are directly related to improving health disparities and outcomes. Jesse has spent 10 years as federal lead for all oncology issues for Amgen, as well as several years as lead for nephrology issues, diseases with strong health disparities in diagnosis, treatment, and outcome. Jesse spent five years as senior legislative assistant for Congressman Jim McDermott on the House Ways and Means Committee. He ran the Congressional Kidney Caucus and the Congressional Caucus of International AIDS and HIV AIDS. He's led efforts to improve coverage in dialysis care, HIV prescription drug coverage in Medicare, and one of the blueprints for national health insurance. Jesse has also held positions at the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and on the Lewin Group, a health policy consulting firm. He has his master's in public policy from the University of California at Berkeley and undergraduate degrees in political science and history from the University of Washington. Please welcome Jesse Kearns. All of our, our, our award recipients for our group picture, please. And while they're posting, you guys will be clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Now, we're going to have just a very, very brief break, and then we're going to start the second half of our day. And we're going to be, in addition to this wonderful health expo, as part of the, um, you know, the headline of our health expo, we're going to be doing a series of presentations, interactive presentations. This is going to be a lot of fun, a lot, very informative, and we're so excited that you guys stay with us throughout this. So if you give us just about five minutes, we're going to get started. And I believe our first um, interactive presentation will actually be done with a Susan G. Komen. It will be uh, in the back side of the room, correct? Okay. 
So you're waving. Wave to everybody where you're going to be. Okay. So great. So we're going to do interactive presentation. We'll give you about five minutes, and I'll make another announcement, and we'll get started. So thank you again for being with us.